thank you for joining us at uh, the Fort Leavenworth series. This is the sixth in our series, and I see very loyal um, um, audience members, so thank you for continuing with us on the day that is so very hot uh, that I know it was probably much more attractive to stay at home. Uh, your speaker today is Dr. Tony R. Mullis, who is an associate professor with the Department of Military History at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College in Fort Leavenworth. He earned his PhD in history from uh, University of Kansas in 2002, and he has taught at the United States Air Force Academy and the Air Command and Staff College at Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama. Dr. Mullis has also taught uh, for the University of Maryland, Troy University, Benedictine College, Tiffin University, and Auburn University at Montgomery. His uh, published uh, book is Peacekeeping on the Plains, Army Operations in Bleeding Kansas. And Dr. Mullins is a 23-year veteran of the U.S. Air Force as an intelligence officer. He retired from the Air Force in 2005, and then we were lucky enough to uh, have him join us at Command and General Staff College. So if you will welcome him, and he will talk to you about the uh, First Indochina War. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a distinct pleasure to be here. Any time to come to Lawrence is always a great experience for me. I was telling a good friend of mine who was able to attend today that um, uh, I met a, another friend of mine downtown for lunch. Forgot it was a sidewalk sale day. Uh, and you're a local, so you understand what I'm talking about. So a couple quick questions for you guys. How many were born before 1965? Okay. I don't think you're going to be surprised by too terribly much today uh, for that age cohort. I know we have some uh, younger folk here, and I'm glad they're here uh, to share in this Vietnam experience. You'll notice that this is a two-part presentation. Uh, Dr. Jim Wilbanks was unable to be with us today, uh, but he should be here, God willing, uh, in August to take us from the Tet Offensive uh, to the end of the American uh, experience in Vietnam. My goal today is to look at a very complex circumstance in international relations and international affairs known as the First Indochina War. To focus the discussion today, I'm going to try to take it from an international history perspective, if that means something to you. If it doesn't, that's okay. Hopefully you'll get the gist of it as I go through uh, the presentation today. Uh, with any luck, I'll have time at the end of the presentation for questions and we'll go from there. But my standard response is, if I don't know, Dr. Wilbanks will, so we'll belay it till next time. Nonetheless, let me get started with this. I feel it's somewhat obligated to at least give acknowledgement to the fact that Vietnam has its own history before the French, before the American participation there. It has a long and rich cultural tradition. It has a long and rich, and although not always friendly, relationship with the Chinese. There are some tensions there that have been around for some time. The Chinese had a habit of occupying Vietnam, controlling Vietnam, and the Vietnamese, understandably, did not much care for that relationship. So over time, they eventually achieved their independence, and of course, when World War II ends, the Chinese are in a civil war. Mao and the Chinese Communist Party will declare their independence in 1949 and posture themselves to help the Viet Minh under Ho Chi Minh that helps lead to the first Indo-Chinese War. Now, of course, the war starts before the end of the Chinese Revolution, but we're gonna look at that relationship a little bit more in depth as we go through today's discussion. And of course, you can't forget the Soviet Union. Uh, they have a role to play in this as well. But before we get to the actual shooting war, the first Indochina War, there was a great competition in Southeast Asia for resources, for territory, and for political economic control of this valuable region of the world. You'll notice from this map that it's largely controlled by the French and the British. Thailand, remarkably, uh, stays out of the mix to a great degree, but you can see the various locations where the French went and where the British went. And that's part of the story because part of the understanding of the Vietnamese reaction to the French presence is anti-colonial, anti-imperial. There's some other reasons that we'll get to as well as we go through today's presentation. So let's start with the familiar, at least to most of the crowd anyway. Uh, how many of you recognize these four gentlemen? Okay, I, I figured you would. Kind of a rhetorical question. Uh, Harry Truman, uh, just born just down the road here in Independence. Ho Chi Minh, 
Mao Zedong and a guy named Joe Stalin. Uh, and the reason I throw these four guys up here is basically to start with some common ground. What do these guys represent and what do they believe in? But we're going to go through a change in leadership here. Truman, of course, uh, opts not to run for various and sundry reasons. Dwight D. Eisenhower is elected, and he too will have to deal with the Southeast Asia problem or with Vietnam as we know it uh, today. Stalin, of course, will ultimately die and is succeeded by Nikita Khrushchev. You heard a little bit about him if you were here last month for the Cuban Missile Crisis. So uh, Khrushchev is in, has a slightly different view of Soviet politics, Soviet objectives. John F. Kennedy will come on the scene. And the other guys, of course, remain the same for a while. And then one of our main topics today, Lyndon Baines Johnson, more affectionately known as LBJ, uh, will show up after the assassination of President Kennedy. And notice everybody else is still on the, on the playing field until you have uh, Leonid Brezhnev take the place of Nikita Khrushchev and that rare instance of a non-death transition uh, in the Soviet Union. So these are the major players, but they all contribute or all symbolize uh, conflict in Southeast Asia. One thing you may have noticed is going through this slide is the two middle guys never change. Okay, uh, They stay there for quite some time. Ho Chi Minh won't die, if I remember correctly, till 69. Uh, Mao makes it to 76, if I remember correctly. So there is a constancy in their outlook on relations and uh, objectives when it comes to Southeast Asia. The Cold War, you may remember it, I do. Okay, I was in the Air Force then. It, uh, uh, things were clear in some ways. We knew who the bad guys were, and of course we were the good guys, and that made life simple. Of course, amazingly, uh, the Soviets were the good guys, at least for a little while. Uh, until things uh, kind of went south, as we say, uh, in the aftermath of World War II. Of course, nuclear weapons add a whole new dimension to international tensions in the aftermath of World War II as well. So I've got these two depictions here that I think kind of capture how we saw the Soviet Union, we the United States, and how the Soviets saw Uncle Sam. Okay. Notice they're almost 180 degrees out. We see the Soviet bear angrily trying to take over the rest of the world to spread the blessings of communism. The little cuddly koala bear there uh, on, on your, yeah, your left, rather, uh, seems to indicate an angry Uncle Sam, uh, encouraging all these other forces around the world to envelop the Soviet Union. And when you have two arch enemies that are armed to the teeth, looking at each other in this fashion, it's hard to find common ground. And that's part of the dilemma that leads to the Cold War, and you've probably heard that a time or two. Nukes certainly contribute to a change in relationships, a change in attitudes. Okay. Many argue that they help end the war against Japan, and there's certainly some justification for that, but now what do you do with them in the 1950s? Uh, Dr. Caratola uh, gave you some explanation if you were here two months ago uh, for his explanation on mutual assured destruction, uh, not so much with missiles, but certainly with nuclear weapons. Okay. But the big time effect or the long term effect of these nuclear devices was essentially to make war limited. We got them, we're not going to get rid of them, but warfare does not go away. It is not peace in our time. It is not an opportunity to sing kumbaya. The Soviet bear, the communist threat, is seen to be alive and very near. We have to do something to protect our interests and those interests of our allies, and the world basically divides into the free world with the U.S. at the leadership and the Soviets as the bad guys, to, uh, for lack of a better term. A couple of things we did. Truman uh, implemented the Truman Doctrine, ostensibly to offer aid to those that are suffering from internal or external pressures, uh, i.e. from communists. We're going to help you. We're going to be there for you. The Marshall Plan. Not only are we going to be there for you, we're going to give you money. Lots and lots of money. Now this has multiple purposes. It helps Europe recover from the devastation of World War II. But if you notice on this particular depiction, the French, who are another topic or focus of our discussion today, receive the second most amount, which allows them to take their own revenues and to pour it into Southeast Asia to support their efforts at reestablishing their empire. More on their strategy as we go along. But the big one is this notion of containment. We must stop the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is a hegemonic power, and unless it's contained, it will infect the rest of the world. But how do you do that? Okay, there's some economic policies, there's political approaches, 
But the one we're most familiar with is the military response to that. And if you look at the Soviet the little bear looking at the rest of the world, they kind of sense that, that, hey, we're surrounded. Everybody is against us. Why are they, why are they so afraid of us? Okay. But again, as an American, we were kind of fearful too. And we'll get more into that as we go along. But here's Joe Stalin trying to expand uh, the Soviet empire for various and sundry reasons, but that is seen as a clear and present danger to the U.S. and to our allies in Europe, particularly uh, what becomes known as NATO. Winston Churchill will give a speech just down the road here in Fulton, Missouri, uh, clarifying that an iron curtain has descended upon Europe, and it is clear uh, who is good and who is evil, and we buy into that for, for many good reasons. But there are other forces that guide the American approach to international relations. The open door, which you may have heard of from in your history classes going back to, again, China of all places in the late 19th, early 20th century, um, was a program or a policy of the United States to ensure free and open markets. If you read our national security strategy today, you'll see access to free markets is one of our foundational principles in our national security. No big change here. But communism was a closed society, and that was not good for anyone's economy. And of course, there's the ideological slam. The Atlantic Charter, signed by FDR, and I think somewhat reluctantly by Winston Churchill, but he signed it nonetheless, which makes some very important promises, not just to Europe, but to the entire world. One of the big ones is they, we, the US, Great Britain, will respect the right of all peoples to form the government under which they live, and they wish to see sovereign rights and self-government restored to those who have been um, uh, forcibly deprived of them. And again, that's what we are Americans are about, is it not? Okay, that's gonna to come to a head, of course, not only in Vietnam, but for our purpose today, that's where we will focus our attention. 1949 and 1950 are very big years in the Cold War that set the stage for our understanding of Vietnam, okay? On the left, you have Joe Wan. Soviets detonate their first atomic weapon in 1949, which sends shockwaves throughout the world. Also in 1949, Mao Zedong, the Chinese Communist Party, sees and maintains control of what becomes the People's Republic of China. This will generate hostility in the American political spectrum. Who lost China? Well, you Democrats did, of course, because Truman was the president. By definition, you lost it. It's all your fault, okay? I say that tongue in cheek, but that's very important because that was a very real concern. And whoever is president after 1949 consistently will promise, I'm not going to lose any more territory to communism. It meshes well with the containment policy. It supports other US national security objectives. And Americans buy into this very logical rhetoric. Okay, that is espoused in 1947, 48, and 49. Even scarier is the Chinese become bosom buddies with the Soviets. Aha, uh -huh, this confirms it. Those commies in Moscow, those commies in the Kremlin are masterminding the, uh, the takeover of the world. Okay, if you're familiar with pinking the brain, it's kind of that sort of thing for, for the younger generation out there. But this scares the Americans because it confirms that image of communism can only be stopped, uh, we have to stop communism and hopefully get rid of it in some shape or form without starting World War III, okay? Because the nuclear dimension has added a new characteristic to what future war might look like. Well, one interesting thing takes place between the Chinese and the Soviets. Notice Mr. Khrushchev and Mr. Mao here don't look exactly happy. Uh, relations had indeed soured in the late 50s into the early 60s, but the image of a communist monolith is still with us. By 1967, anyone read Chinese perchance? That's okay. Uh, my understanding of the translation, uh, if you can read the bottom there, it's a Chinese poster that says, down with Soviet revisionism. The Soviets have lost the bubble. They have lost the purpose of communism. We are the true leaders of the movement. So this schism, this split, is very clear, certainly by the mid-60s, but not before it has an impact on American decision-making uh, in Indochina, more specifically in Vietnam. Of course, one form of comfort for the Chinese is they explode their own atomic device in 1964. It's nice to be a member of the nuclear club uh, when you can. LBJ, much like presidents today, had to make a decision, do I take it out or do I allow it 
to continue. President Kennedy had to do that with Cuba, and Johnson opted, and eh, we'll leave well enough alone. Okay, who knows what would happen if we try to take out uh, Chinese nuclear weapons. So from 64 to 67, we see this big transition in relations between China and the rest of the world. The Korean War. Any Korean War vets? Sometimes we, oh, excellent. Thanks for your service. Glad you could make it today. Korea, of course, creates all sorts of images, all sorts of expectations for what's going to happen in Vietnam. Okay, no more Koreas. Amen? No more Koreas. Okay, we're not going to do that ever again because it leaves a sour taste in Americans' mind because it ends in an armistice. Who won? Well, we're still debating that uh, 50, 60, going on 70 years after the fact. Okay. The French view is a little bit different, though, than the Americans as far as what the world should look like in the post-World War II era. They want to reestablish their economy, reestablish their political viability to be a member of the UN Security Council, which they are. Okay, but how do you justify your existence? Well, Southeast Asia is part of the formula. We're going to recolonize, we're going to um, uh, reinvest, and we're going to get strong. But there is a problem. Now, there's an analogy or a metaphor that the French use that's very similar to what Dwight D. Eisenhower will use in 1954. Uh, and they use the game of 10 pin, what we call bowling. Okay, and the head pin, the linchpin to all of this is a little place called Vietnam. If Vietnam falls, what's going to happen to all the other pins? They're going to topple over. Okay, in much the same way, Dwight D. Eisenhower will articulate this to the American public only in the form of dominoes. Okay, and most of us, if not all of us, have seen if you stack the dominoes just right and hit them, everything will fall. That was the fear, that was the aspect of the administration's rhetoric that convinced the Americans, by God, they're right. We've got to stop communism wherever it rears its ugly head. It can't be allowed to expand because that will only infect different countries, different peoples, and different regions. So we must stop it wherever it rears its ugly head. Again, a, a graphical image of this, uh, from, certainly from an American perspective, where you see these arrows going out from China into Japan, Taiwan, uh, Thailand, you, you name it. It's, if, if you give an inch, they're going to take a mile. The Munich analogy is still there with the American public. You can't negotiate. You can't appease communist hegemonic dictators. They're only going to take more. So we've got to stop them with every instrument of power that we can possibly use. But one thing I'd like to caution you on that we forget sometimes, that we get so fixated on Southeast Asia we forget that the main effort is in Germany, more specifically Berlin. Okay, I hope, trust you're familiar with the division of Germany after the war, the reunification of the Federal Republic of Germany, uh, the DDR, uh, where the Soviets uh, maintain their sector. Berlin is four different sectors as well. Uh, so it's it's a, a tinderbox for war. If something goes horribly wrong, who's going to stop the Soviets from invading? or from the Soviet's perspective, uh, the, the NATO group as it eventually becomes as well. So the tensions are here. There's a lot of linkage between Southeast Asia and what goes on in Europe. And the French will milk that leverage to their perceived national interest. They will convince the Americans, hey, you got to stop communism. Give us, give us some more money. Okay? Give us some more equipment. Give us some more toys to play with. Okay? So that's part of the problem as well. But the real challenge is, what about West Germany? Do you rearm West Germany in this new NATO alliance or what the Americans are advocating, the European defense community? If you're a Frenchman and that offer comes out in the newspaper, should we arm or rearm the Germans, what's your gut reaction? No, no, I don't think so, monsieur. <laughs> um, the Germans have visited us, uh, well, three times if you count the Franco-Prussian War uh, in the last 50, 60 years. No more, no mas, no more Germans, okay? Uh, but the French are able to use that leverage. Well, maybe we'll consider that if, you see where we're going with that. If you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. But the Soviets are saying, hey, French, we like your attitude, okay? We'll help you out maybe in Vietnam. Now, that doesn't sound quite right because you got communists working with the French, uh, not directly necessarily. There's some vague hints that uh, we can make this happen. Okay, so the real scenario, the real issue is always going to be Europe-centric and Europe-focused. Uh, EDC never comes about, but the Germans ultimately will be rearmed, as we all know, and will join NATO a little bit later on, as you see in this uh, picture here of the signing of the agreement that did that. 
Now, let's turn our attention to Vietnam. The Vietnamese get a vote in this story. Uh, after all, without the Vietnamese, it wouldn't be much of a, of a challenge. Ho Chi Minh, of course, personifies the Vietnam War. If you had to pick one person, yes, Giap, uh, there are other famous Vietnamese leaders that are out there, but it's Ho that really captures the spirit of the revolution. He goes to France, he helps form the French Communist Party, he goes to Paris and Versailles, he is pertinent in the establishment of the Indo-Chinese Communist Party, or the ICP. He generates or creates the Viet Minh, which is the League for the Independence of Vietnam to fight against the Japanese in World War II. I mean, he's done it all. He's a visionary, he's articulate, he's charismatic. He is the one guy that pulls the Vietnamese together. He is very much a nationalist, but he's also very much a communist. So what does that mean if you're the United States of America? Yes, Mr. Ho, we appreciate your quoting the Declaration of Independence, declaring Vietnamese independence. On the other hand, you're a bad juju. You're, you're a commie. And the only good commie is, well, you can fill in the blank as, as, as appropriate uh, in that. But if you're Ho Chi Minh and you're in a re, uh, an attempt by the colonial powers to reassert their authority, what can you do? Well, basically, there's two choices. You can accommodate the French and say, yes, French master, uh, I'll do what you say until I get a chance to get rid of you, or you resist. And of course, Ho and the Viet Minh will choose to resist against the French or any other perceived imperial power that comes into Southeast Asia. Very famous quote from, um, oh, let me see if I can scoot this over a little bit. Sorry about that. Yeah, that should be a little better. Um, very famous quote from Ho about exactly how is he going to succeed. The Vietnamese people will not give up. Whatever you do to us, we have an objective that we're committed to, that we're going to fight to the death to, and that is unification and independence. Okay? As Americans, some would make the argument, you know, we kind of felt that way once upon a time in the American Revolution, but enough said on that. His philosophy that he articulated early on in which he will practice consecutively. Okay, and he used the elephant and tiger metaphor, which I think will, will resonate with us to a certain degree. And the Vietnamese, of course, are the tiger. And they're not as big as the elephant, they're not as powerful as the elephant, but if they're persistent, if they take one bite at a time, they're gonna do a number on that elephant. Somewhat perhaps reminiscent today of another elephant that has entered into a, a, a discussion uh, not that the uh, Missouri Tigers have entered into the SEC, uh, perhaps they should take uh, Ho's uh, a strategy here and apply it when uh, Alabama comes visiting in October. And one slight change here on the, uh, uh, the quote, uh, the war of the SEC. So we'll see how that goes. Of course, there are other Tigers in the conference as well. But back to more serious matters. The strategy that Ho will basically follow is something known as Dao Tron. Okay. It's a mix of Mao, it's a mix of Lenin, it's a mix of original thought from Ho, uh, but it's a very pragmatic approach to how to defeat imperial powers, whether it's the French or ultimately the United States. So the pragmatic aspect is what I want to emphasize, that Ho is not the ideologue that Mr. Mao will become a little bit later on. What about the French strategy? How are they going to hold on to this empire, or this reassertion of imperialism in Southeast Asia? Well, first they go back to tradition, back to the future. Well, a long, long time ago, uh, the Vietnamese had an emperor, and they still have one, although he's kind of a playboy by trade. Uh, so let's reinstall Bao Dai. So Bao Dai, congratulations, you're the new leader of Vietnam. Well, of course, North Vietnam didn't go over so well, but even in the South, there's some resistance to this reassertion of monarchy, if you will, in the South. The French will also adapt from a military perspective, a hold, seek, and destroy strategy to try to eradicate the Viet Minh, the communist in the North particularly. Okay. Didn't turn out so well, but hold on to that thought because just because it didn't work for the French doesn't mean it's not gonna work for us Americans, right? Because we're Americans. Okay, hold on to that thought. The train was also different in South Vietnam or rather in Vietnam. Uh, jungle, triple canopy jungle, you know the, you've seen the pictures, you know the routine. About this hot only with humidity, which has got to be unbearable from my perspective. Uh, four strength issues, never enough men to do the job. Never enough surge material just to get us over the top so that we can eradicate uh, these Viet Minh uh, pests. And understanding the notion of revolutionary war that 
Ho and the Viet Minh were advocating and were practicing. Basically, you get the three-stage process, the strategic defensive, the strategic stalemate, and the strategic offensive. And the beauty of the system is, without going into too much detail, is you go back and forth as the situation dictates. Okay. Now, you'll constantly see within the Viet Minh leadership that is it time for stage three yet? When can we go offensive? When can we take them out? Uh, they try that a couple times, not so much, but eventually, uh, with persistence, it will work out. But that's for next month's discussion. Okay, so Vietnam is the key, but we can't forget the rest of Southeast Asia as well. Laos and Cambodia are also critical to understanding what's going on in this region of the world, and more on those as we go along. Well, the French will institute something known as the Navarre Plan, 1953 into 1954. It does not turn out so well, particularly at a very famous battle known as Dien Bien Phu. Okay. Fortunately, no time to go into the details, but to suffice it to say, uh, the French, in their zeal to implement their strategy, uh, fail to defeat the Viet Minh. Matter of fact, the Viet Minh do almost uh, supernatural uh, uh, feats by uh, bagging the French military there. Not completely, but they are forced to surrender by May. But prior to the French surrender, the French will send an emissary to Washington and say, hey, Mr. President, hey, U.S., we need some help. You have airplanes. You have airplanes with big bombs that go kaboom, okay? Uh, might we borrow those or might you send those over to help us out? President Eisenhower kind of says, oh, I hate these decisions. Uh, what do you do? You don't want to lose Vietnam to communism, right? Okay. Uh, but the French don't look like they're ever going to win. And the French had come to that conclusion, so you can imagine the Americans drew similar conclusions. But what good would a conventional or a nuclear or atomic assault in the vicinity of DNB and Fu actually do? What targets actually exist that you can use nuclear weapons on to achieve a political objective? So that's part of the problem there. Ultimately, Eisenhower will come back based on uh, some recommendation from his uh, cabinet and say, I am not going to send one American foot soldier 10,000 miles to those rice paddies in Southeast Asia. It is in my mind not in the interest of the United States. Ironically, 10 years later, 11 years, uh, depending on, on when you start the, the buildup, LBJ will face a similar dilemma of whether or not to send combat troops into Vietnam. But we're going to get to that before we end today. Fighting stops. Let's have peace talks. We go to a lovely location, Geneva, Switzerland. If you've been there, highly recommend it. Uh, but at Geneva, Lots of things happen on the international plane that set the stage for American, more American involvement in Southeast Asia. To make a long story short, the basic three things that come out. We're going to divide the country at the 17th parallel. This sounds vaguely familiar. Okay. Remember, Germany's in pieces parts. Korea's in, uh, in two halves at the 38th parallel. So, but it's only going to be temporary. Okay. We're going to give the Vietnamese two years to get their, their act together. Uh, we're going to give a 300-day period to allow folks in the north that want to go south, largely Catholics, uh, to go south. We're going to give folks in the south opportunity to go north, largely communist supporters, although the numbers uh, coming south are far greater. Okay. But the Viet Minh will leave a small contingent, anywhere from 5, 10, 15,000 folks, in South Vietnam just in case the agreement doesn't go as advertised. Okay. So basically, the solution, like a good American solution, is to have elections, democracy in action. That'll solve the whole problem. Well, do the elections ever occur? No. Okay, but why not? Any ideas? Can you trust a communist to vote properly? Who are they going to vote for? Communists. And who's the number one communist in Vietnam? Ho Chi Minh. Okay. So it was a foregone conclusion that if an election had occurred in 1956, who else is going to win but Ho Chi Minh? They're not going to vote for Bao Dai. He doesn't really like the job anyway. Okay, so it's a conundrum for America, it's a conundrum for France, and it's a conundrum specifically for what we will call South Vietnam or the South Vietnamese. Okay, the French do leave as they say they will do. Uh, Operation uh, 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 Freedom Passage takes place, the switches occur, uh, but all this is doing is buying time for both sides to think strategies, to rearm, and to prepare for an inevitable civil war that seems to be on the horizon. Well, much to the Chinese um, uh, uh, surprise, they're kind of a big winner at Geneva. 
The United States does not recognize the People's Republic of China. We recognize the Republic of China, also known as Taiwan at this point. Okay. But the Chinese are participants at Geneva. The Chinese will influence Vietnamese decision making. The Vietnamese want to unify the country now. We don't want to wait till 56, but we will to let this process work. The Chinese say, well, 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 okay. Uh, that may be your interest, but our interest is to keep the Americans out of Southeast Asia. We experienced them in Korea. We don't want to do that again, okay, which is an interesting attitude because we Americans don't want to do that again, but yet we both think we're after that same object. So it's a very interesting phenomenon that takes place. But the Chinese, at this point, make a name for themselves. They begin to assume leadership, at least in their minds, of the communist movement. And they do influence the Viet Minh. They provide money, they provide materiel, they provide advisors. There's a Chinese military advisory group as early as 1950, again, after 1949, once that civil war is over. Images of Mao, uh, much like the Kremlin, uh, being a puppeteer controlling all of Southeast Asia uh, are what we as Americans tend to perceive, but the reality is far different. There's a lot of angst, tension, animosity between the Chinese and the North Vietnamese. Yes, there's a lot of support, and the Vietnamese are grateful. Just don't tell me what to do, Mr. Mao. We'll make our own decisions. So, that sets the stage for some controversy that, if you're familiar with 1979 and the uh, incursion of the Chinese into North Vietnam, uh, that's just a manifestation of that. Okay, so who's going to be this new leader? Who's going to be the new George Washington of South Vietnam? Or who, in the words of Lyndon Baines Johnson, is going to be the Churchill of Asia? And the winner is Yen Go Zien Zien. Okay, many of you. I uh, have heard of him, you probably have an opinion of him, uh, but for better or for worse, he was the man. Ziem is a Catholic, he's an ardent nationalist, and he is a staunch anti-communist. Okay. He may not be the best administrator, he may not be the best political leader, he thinks of himself as a Mandarin, uh, as kind of an elect member of uh, Vietnamese society that doesn't need necessarily to be in contact with the average uh, Vietnamese citizen, I have your best interest at heart. He and his uh, brother um, uh, knew uh, will basically uh, with, uh, conduct what they call personalized uh, government. We know what your interests are. We will take care of you, not to worry. Doesn't work out so well. Becomes known for corruption. Become not ZM per se, but his administration certainly does. And he makes a name for himself early on in the Sec Crisis of 1955, the Kao Dai, uh, the Hoi Hoi. Uh, and another name I can't pronounce particularly well, the Ben Zion, I think. Uh, but basically, he suppresses that, and that kind of gives a glimmer of hope that maybe this guy can stand on his own two feet. Maybe he can pull South Vietnam together as a country. The United States will recognize South Vietnam in October of 1955, prior to when these elections are supposed to take place. Zim says, I didn't sign any paper. Uh, we're, we have no obligation to conduct an election. Besides, if we did, who, how, how far can you trust a communist? Okay, so the elections are off, and that creates the circumstances for now what do we do? From the U.S. perspective, we're going to start sending even more money, but also military advisors to help assist Vietnam put together a new army. This may sound vaguely familiar, but develop a, a solid infrastructure. Uh, build schools, you know the routine, okay? We're, we're, the beginnings of that are here. Uh, President Kennedy, of course, uh, uh, and LBJ will take it even further. So, ZM is in, but realistically, who else are we gonna choose? There was no real charismatic counterpart to Ho Chi Minh, and that's going to be a problem, fundamentally, for the whole Vietnam experience. As I mentioned earlier, there were other areas that are as important to American foreign policy, to Chinese foreign policy, and even Soviet foreign, foreign policy, just as Vietnam was. Laos and Cambodia are largely dealt with, particularly Laos, through this notion of neutralization. Okay. We're going to create the circumstances that it doesn't matter what happens in places like Laos, which will form, at least temporarily, uh, for lack of a better term, a coalition government. We're gonna bring the Patat Lao, the communists, we're gonna bring the royalists, we're gonna bring the neutralists in and live happily ever after. Well, on paper, that works out pretty well, but the Laotians get a vote in that ultimately. But Laos, much like Cambodia, is perceived as a sideshow, but it's very important because of a, a, a little a transportation route known as the, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Okay. Neutralization implies neutrality, but 
in a very real sense, neither Cambodia nor Laos could ever be neutral. It was not in the interest of the North Vietnamese, it was not in the interest of the Americans, it was not in the interest of the Chinese. So we kind of pretended that these were neutral countries and then conducted our business as appropriate. And President Kennedy, of course, was among uh, the first to try to solve that dilemma. Uh, but the other problem is Laos is a landlocked country. Uh, how do you even think of a military solution in this part of the world, which is part of the problem as well? One of the solutions is war advisors. We're going to start sending more advisors, more money, more equipment to the Vietnamese. We're going to build up the Army of the Republic of Vietnam and make it one of the best conventional armies the world has ever seen. We remember Korea. The mistake we made there was not training the ROC Army, the Korean Army, to withstand a conventional invasion from the north. We're not going to let that happen again. Okay. So the South Vietnamese Army is well trained uh, just in case the North Koreans come across the 17th parallel. Okay. Yes, there are other aspects that they train on, policing, civil guard, etc., but not to the degree, as history will show, necessary to deal with pacification, to deal with counterinsurgency as we understand it as it evolves later on. The Ho Chi Minh Trail, very important supply line to the indigenous Viet Cong or the indigenous uh, National Liberation Front to a certain degree in the South. Okay. Uh, ZM will refer to them as the VC, the Viet Cong. Charlie is a very popular name if you watch the movies, and there are plenty to choose from. Okay. But how do you stop this okay, without escalating into a larger conflict? Because one thing the Chinese, the Soviets, the Americans do not want is World War III. So it's a very delicate situation for everybody involved. You couple the corruption, the lack of progress, for lack of a better term, in South Vietnam with another religious crisis in South Vietnam. I mentioned earlier that Xi'an's a Catholic. Catholicism is not the predominant religion of Vietnam. Okay? Uh, Buddhists, probably 50, 60, if not higher percent of the country. There's some oppression, some repression, largely by new, again, Xi'an's brother, against the Buddhists, and they react in a very different manner. I wouldn't call this guy a terrorist exactly because he's not trying to kill anyone else for political purpose, but he is trying to send a political message by immolation, by burning himself in a public square to send a message, not just to ZM, but to the rest of the world, that, hey, look, we're being oppressed here in Vietnam, which helps the communist cause because, hey, we've got a solution. Come join us. We'll make life better for you. Okay, so that's part of the problem as well, but it's compounded when you have New's lovely wife, Madam New, make what are now known as infamous comments, well, if those monks want to have barbecues, I'll be more than happy to provide extra gasoline and matches, okay? Does not win the hearts and minds of the rank and file of the Buddhist population of South Vietnam, but that's part of the problem as well. So ZM has some capabilities, has some qualities that might make him a good leader, but they never come together. He never assumes that um, level of capability to pull South Vietnam into a coherent, cohesive nation state as we understand it today. Okay. Uh, if you look at Afghanistan, I think, and not exactly, but in a very similar way, how do you get the Afghanis, as we define them, to see themselves as Afghanis and not tribal um, uh, kinsmen, uh, not uh, uh, Pashtuns or whatever? Okay. Same problem you have in Vietnam. How do you instill the sense of South Vietnamese nationalism? Never able to do it, and unfortunately for Zim and his brother Nu, uh, and I think in the euphemism of the day, they encounter an accidental suicide. Okay, in November of 1963, a mere three weeks before President Kennedy himself is assassinated uh, in Dallas, Texas. This, of course, will change the complexion of the internal politics of South Vietnam. General Min, or Big Min as he's known as, will take over, but he's soon replaced by General Khan, who's soon replaced by another general, and you get the picture, coup after coup after coup. The instability of South Vietnam is threatening to bring this infrastructure down. And what can the U.S. do to keep it propped up to bring South Vietnam into full nationhood and to stop communism again at the 17th parallel? That's the dilemma du jour. Well, given the internal, the external pressures that take place, the, the big trigger event, and I'm sure many of you if you don't remember this, you, you know of it, not all of you, but many of you will, the Tonkin Gulf incident in August of 1964. Most Americans could not identify where in the world Vietnam was in August of 1964 because we had more important things to do. Okay? 
But in the Tonkin Gulf, uh, there was an incident on the 2nd where North uh, Vietnamese patrol boats actually um, uh, assault US vessels, USS Maddox. Um, oh, this is bad juju, that we're in international waters, you shouldn't be shooting at us, uh, what do we do about it? Okay. Well, of course, the other side of the story is something known as O-Plan 34 Alpha, the SOTO operations. There are some active uh, special forces counter uh, operations going on by the South Vietnamese in the North that is in close proximity to what's going on with the Max. But regardless, the U.S. sovereign flag has been attacked. So what are you going to do, Mr. Johnson? Well, let's see what happens. Two days later, guess what happens? Another incident, or alleged incident, takes place in the Tonkin Gulf. Uh, the Sea Turner Joy is deployed, and sonar operators are convinced that they see torpedoes and other munitions coming their way. Well, to make a long story short, in hindsight, chances of this ever happening, or this never did happen. Okay, the evidence suggests this was just an, an image on the sonar operator's uh, uh, scope. And if you put yourself in their shoes, you can kind of understand, hey, there was an incident two days ago. You're going to be extra uh, careful about what you see on that scope. And anything that looks like an attack, by God, it is an attack. Maybe it's a shark, maybe it's a whale, maybe it's just waves, uh, depending on what the sea state was. Nonetheless, this information goes to LBJ. What's going to happen in November of 1964? An election. We have one every four years in November, it seems like. We're going to have one this year, if I recall correctly. Johnson must take action. I will not see the American flag besmirched by these communists. I will show the American public I am tough. I am not going to lose Vietnam to communism. I'm going to stand up for what's right, and that Barry Goldwater guy better pay attention to me. Okay? If you know anything about Barry, Senator Goldwater, uh, he is a staunch anti communist and he has a solution. Okay? Uh, we don't have time to play the famous commercial, but if you remember it, just play it through your head, and you know what's going on with the 10, 9, 8, uh, et cetera. Based on the real incident and the perceived incident, Johnson takes a stand. He will uh, send a message to Congress and articulate uh, his plan for the future, which becomes known as the Tonkin Gulf Resolution. Okay. Very simply, America keeps her word. We're an honorable people. This is not about us. It's about the future of Southeast Asia. Our purpose is peace. This is not just a jungle war, but a struggle for freedom for all of human activity. So it's not American interest. It's for the free world that we get involved in Vietnam. But how are we going to pay for this, Mr. Johnson? You've made some other promises to us, the American public, something known as the Great Society. And many of those programs are still with us today. How are we going to pay for that and for Vietnam? Oh, there's plenty of more money. No new taxes. Well, maybe. We'll see how that works out. But we're not going to call up the reserves. We're going to expand the draft. We're going to protect those high-cost uh, uh, programs for domestic purposes. And we're not always going to tell you what's going on because, well, you just don't need to know. Okay. That's a very simplistic explanation, much more complicated than that, but just to get the sense of what's going on for the national strategy. Johnson, in other words, has now taken the tiger by the tail. Okay. But the problem is, once you grab hold of the tiger, when do you let go? Johnson is committed to the U.S. policy goal of a non-communist independent South Vietnam, and he will stay true to that purpose. Who's he going to call? General William Westy Westmoreland, okay? Times Man of the Year in 1965, and the guy, Johnson cautions, uh, don't go MacArthur on me, for you Korean veterans out there, uh, because this is a limited war with limited purposes for the United States of America. And the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, recognize, hey, those Americans are pretty smart. They're very capable. They've got lots of stuff. Uh, they know what they're doing, but they fall short in a couple of key areas. They don't understand who we are. They haven't taken the time to look at our culture, our history, our traditions. Okay, Going back to that first slide uh, that I mentioned earlier. Well, this is where escalation really takes off. Okay, Once you start uh, uh, bringing American forces into Vietnam, whether it's air power or not, then you need to protect those American resources. So you send in the Marines to Da Nang in March of 1965. Uh, and once you establish security there, well, we are offensive minded, so let's go and take care of this enclave. So one step leads logically to the other. And to conduct these operations, you need more troops. You need more airplanes. You need more stuff. And that's essentially, in a very simplistic uh, term, what happens. But there are those that are saying, Mr. President, time out. Uh, do you know what you're doing here? Are you getting us involved in something that we may not want to do in the long-term future? 
But Mr. Johnson took George Ball's advice, and I don't have time to go into his recommendations, but they're very prescient. But in President Johnson's defense, he's got a lot of other folks telling him, yeah, this is the right track. We don't want to go whole hog because we don't want World War III, but we can't do nothing. We can't just pull out because our image, our credibility will be ruined. So those are some of the alternatives that came out at the time. We go through Rolling Thunder, which is the air element saying, and it gives airmen a chance to prove our doctrine. Hey, we can take care of the boss. We'll, we'll save the uh, South Vietnam from the north. We'll take out the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And basically, as you all know the story, well, how many bombs do you need? Well, just a few more. A few more sorties, a few more this. Again, in very simplistic fashion. And you notice Mr. Octopus shows up again. Notice Mao is an octopus. Now Ho is an octopus. And those airstrikes are going to cut those tentacles right off. And we will save South Vietnam from communism. Well, West Vegas comes to a crossroads uh, by 64, 65, into 66, and changes the strategy to search and destroy. Remember the French strategy of hold, seek, and find? OK, not too dissimilar. But if you're General Westmoreland, what options do you really have? What is your army trained to do? Where's the main threat? Back in Germany, the Fulda Gap. We do conventional operations, and we do them extremely well. So if we can get the other guys to play our game, we're going to win this thing. It becomes an attrition-based strategy, which has its positive points, but there are also some negative aspects to that as well. There is another war that begins to take root at this point, too, from the American perspective of pacification. Westmoreland is often criticized for not even caring about the counterinsurgency or the pacification effort, but as not necessarily a compliment to Westmoreland, but the US government, at least, begins cords of civil operations and revolutionary development support effort as a result uh, of their interest to realize that, hey, yes, it's good to kill the commies, but we got to win the hearts and minds of the South Vietnamese people as well. Johnson went through numerous uh, times where he had to endure the agony of decision making. I would want his job, particularly in the 1960s, but somebody had to do it. Uh, and of course, you have a reaction from the American public. Okay. The peace movement uh, is not as large as it will be a little bit later on, but its roots certainly have taken place in uh, the mid-60s at this point. But to top it off and to set the stage for next month, this is where uh, the administration makes a conscious effort to convince the American public that, hey, we're going to win this thing. Matter of fact, we are winning this thing. Okay? General Westy, go out to the American public and tell them that we're winning, that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. There's more to that story, but I want to give you that glimmer of optimism that existed in late 1967 before the other shoe drops, uh, as you all know, in January of 1968 and what becomes known as Tet. Some contemporary uh, remembrances um, that might resonate with you guys as we wrap up here, uh, and just some contemporary, uh, and I know Secretary Rumsfeld is supposed to be here next week, so don't bring this up if he, if he, if he, if, if he asks, okay? <laughs> Uh, but Vietnam really hasn't gone away out of our psyche, and we're going to learn a lot more next week as we look at that. Last food for thought here, uh, I mentioned Xiem as the Winston Churchill of Asia. Well, the real Winston Churchill, I think, really gets into the heart of why America got involved in Vietnam. He says, nothing is worse than war. Well, but is that true? He says, slavery is worse than war. And of course, to Americans, communism was nothing more than slavery. Dishonor is worse than war. We've made a commitment to the South Vietnamese people. We are not going to give up on these people. We will do what we need to ensure we achieve success. But on the other hand, war, as General Sherman once said, is indeed hell. Okay, whether it's limited war, total war, counterinsurgency, it's all the same. And on that happy note and food for thought, I hope you'll be back uh, next month for Dr. Wilbanks as he uh, gives you more insight into this conflict, but takes it from Tet to Vietnamization and the end of the war. So that being said, I think we have about 10 minutes left or so for questions. So uh, if you would, raise your hand, and we have the mic here uh, to get your question, and then we'll go from there. If I forget, thanks for your participation and your engagement. That really helps me out. I know I go 90 to nothing sometimes, but hopefully you got the gist of the uh, discussion today. Sir. Uh, in, this, uh, in this time frame, uh, I was in the insurance business, and coincidentally, uh, my boss was one of the few people uh, who had been drafted into the SAS and had been in Malaya. And, uh, you know, I was a young guard lieutenant at the time, and uh, he said to me, why haven't you people learned from us, starting with leather boots versus the, uh, the jungle boot and so on? And why, in your uh, analysis of this, 
would we have not have paid attention to uh, what, the, uh, what the Brits did in Malaya, which was successful? Yeah, good question. And I didn't plant this because I keep some emergency slides back here. And, and this is Malaya that you're referencing uh, uh, as well. And we've never met. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. And I concur with that, too. But this is a General Templar who is one of the, the brains behind the success of the Malayan emergency, as the British call it. And the, the term Malayan emergency says a lot in and of itself uh, that it is not war, uh, but it's something short of that. And the British. Um, take advantage of some distinct differences that exist between Malaya and Vietnam. Vietnam is this huge, um, long country with a huge sea coast uh, with uh, uh, many areas of sanctuary. Malaya, um, and this is not the best map of Malaya to use, but it's, it's a peninsula. It's surrounded by water by three sides. And the United States, with the vaunted U.S. Navy, can pretty much dominate the sea lines of communication. Uh, the border it has with Thailand is sealed off. So the Malayan communist terrorists, or CTs as they were called by the British, have no real means to seek sanctuary. They have no reliable resupply. Uh, they're kind of out there on their own. Now, they're committed as any other communist uh, to, to their ideals. The other difference with Malaya is most, if not all, of the communist terrorists, as they're referred to, are Chinese, ethnically Chinese. They stand out in Malay society as well. So you have an enemy that's readily identifiable an enemy that is short on resources and can suffer the effects of British strategy, which is basically to, uh, over the long haul, to a trip. Depending on which book you read about the Malayan emergency, from 48 to 60 is kind of the traditional time frame. So it took the British 12 years to totally eradicate this. So it took a while. But the other thing that the, the Brits do that I think is noteworthy and it's debatable to whether, to what degree it would work in Vietnam, uh, is this interrelationship of civilian and military, political and military uh, relationships uh, that you do look at the Malayan people. The Malayan people writ large got a lot of the freedoms, rights uh, that some didn't even know they were supposed to be having uh, administered to them because the British decided, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna lighten up, we're gonna pull off, uh, we don't wanna lose this. Uh, so there's a change of heart in the British approach that on the one hand keeps the Malayan population relatively happy, uh, they go through, and you may be alluding to this earlier, the rough equivalent of the Strategic Hamlet program, where they take these ethnic Chinese and physically separate them uh, from uh, the rest of the population, and they can identify, in Air Force terms, friend or foe, <laughs> or IFF as we usually call it. Uh, and the demographics, the topography, the geography, the political objectives of the British, I think, make it far different than Vietnam. That being said, Sir Robert Thompson, who is, is one of the theorists of the British effort in Malaya, uh, is an advisor to the Americans in Vietnam. And he does make some suggestions. You know, you could be doing this a little bit better, okay, over time, uh, that this worked there. But, for example, as you probably know, in Vietnam, when you tried the Strategic Hamlet program, it was an abysmal failure. But the circumstances were so different. You weren't uprooting a, a small minority. You were uprooting the, the main population centers uh, to a large degree in the rural areas of ethnic Vietnamese, relocating them off of their land, which they lived on for hundreds, if not thousands of years, uh, and they never really understood why. And then once you get them in these enclaves, who are you protecting us from? Uh, are, are, are we protecting you from somebody else? So it's, it's similar, but it, it's different enough that I think that Malaya, uh, and I, I think we should look at Malaya as, in the 21st century as professional military officers, to understand why it worked and what made it work. But basically ask those questions that the British ask. Why do we handle this differently than Vietnam is? And then it's a long-winded response, but does that get close to what you were looking for or, or, or asking about? So, sir. And I may not have a slide for all these questions, so, so don't expect that. So. Do I correctly assume, based on your presentation, that you would reject the Mark Moyer approach that, oh, we, we, we could have won the war in 1964, we could have sent three divisions into North and the Chinese wouldn't have intervened? Uh, yeah, thanks for bringing Dr. I, I love listening to Dr. Moore because he has some, some, he does stir the pot. So does Andrew Kropinovich, so does uh, Harry Sumners. And, and as you're, if you're well read, as, as you seem to be, then you know, there's a lot of controversy out there over Vietnam. Uh, General Westmoreland, uh, Louis Sorley has come out, you know, this is the guy that lost the war for us. Okay. How can one guy lose the Vietnam War for us? So there's a lot of, con and, and it's, it's not necessarily not worth reading, 
Uh, but you've got to keep, you know, keep the proverbial open mind uh, with that. I'm going to go to George Ball here and see if that, that helps, uh, because George Ball uh, wasn't the most prominent member of the Johnson administration, but he does have some contrarian views. Okay, let me just share this with you. We have bombed North Vietnam systematically for more than two months. After initial attacks last August and early February, this is 64 into 65, yet there is no convincing evidence that Ho Chi Minh and his colleagues have the slightest interest in meeting our terms. If there is no evidence that the North Vietnamese people are ready to quit, then there's uh, even less reason to believe that they would be permitted to do so by the Hanoi regime itself, which has conspired to get control of a unified Vietnam, their original objective. For 20 years, the regime has waited the consequences of our threatened attacks for almost one year and is apparently ready to accept likely cost. Chinese and Russian supplies of MiGs and advanced anti-aircraft equipment have no doubt strengthened their resolve. So long as victory in the South appears possible, Hanoi's determination can probably be broken only by, and this is getting to your question, by the total devastation of North Vietnam and its occupation by U.S. forces. And this, my friend, is not in the cards. This is a limited war. If this was Nazi Germany, if this was communist Russia, uh, had the fold the gap thing turned out, then we're all in. But Johnson's not playing Texas Hold'em at least not in that fashion. Uh, George Herring made a very interesting uh, assessment of the LBJ's administration, describing his Vietnam policy being very much constructed and to coin or paraphrase from uh, Truman Capote, in cold blood. That it's hard to be dispassionate about something as important as Vietnam, but he was very passionate about the great society. But looking at what he saw as the evidence, getting the advice, and it's all over the place from his advisors, and I try to emphasize with these decision makers, what would I do? I said, I wouldn't want the job in the first place, but somebody has to be there. Somebody has to lead and make these tough decisions. And in his mind, I can't give up on Vietnam, but I can't create World War III. Does that make sense? So I can do this much, but no more. And Herring makes the argument that every president kind of makes their policy based on that principle. I got to show the American public I'm not losing but what are the consequences of winning? Is it, as George Ball says, the complete and utter destruction of North Vietnam and long-term American occupation and reconstruction, a la Germany and Japan, that we just went through in World War II? But is this that kind of war? It's not for the United States. It might be for the Vietnamese, but it's not, it's not in the cards, as George Ball said. Is that close. And, and of course, uh, Professor Moyer is more than entitled to his opinion, as are the other scholars uh, in Vietnam. Uh, and uh, next month, uh, Dr. Wilbanks will be more than happy to share his, uh, his insights into uh, some of the current literature with that. Yes, sir. This oh, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is probably under lessons learned, maybe. Uh, don't you think it would have helped the unification of the country if we'd had a fairer draft? I think the fact we were deferring the college students, of which my son was one of them, but we became a class draft, and I think we should never do that again. Yeah, and I think the American government has made note of that. If you notice our experience in Iraq and Afghanistan, that they're, they're you know, I don't want to say we're all in as a nation per se because of the limitations that we've been involved with, but the National Guard, the reserves, uh, the active and reserve components, as we refer to them, uh, have, have, have acted and, and responded as a team. So I think on that level, that is a lesson we have learned. The draft did not come back. It's still an all-voluntary force, and you, you rightly point out that the complications with that. And uh, as a Christian AP, uh, there's been some, some work done on working-class war, uh, and that gets kind of out there on the edge in some cases, depending on your political perspective. Uh, but when you look at the demographics, it does raise some interesting questions. One of the songs I thought about playing earlier, and I practiced on uh, our, our erstwhile uh, uh, youthful guy here, uh, was A Fortunate Son, uh, which some of you may remember is, hey, I don't have a deferment, I'm not the son of a senator, you know, I, I guess I'm going to war. And that did have an impact in the long term. I think if Americans saw Vietnam as they did Nazi Germany or any other evil empire, uh, we would have, it wouldn't have been a big deal. Yeah, let's, let's go for it. Let's get the boys out there, and, and today, of course, women, uh, to, to squash that evil, to, to do what we do best. Uh, 
But Vietnam was never couched exactly in those terms. Uh, we don't want, again, total war. We don't want World War III. We want to limit, contain communism, but we don't want to provoke Chinese intervention or Soviet intervention, which some scholars today have seen that the Chinese especially uh, were more than willing to do Korea part two. If the US invaded North Vietnam, where that line was, I'm not sure, but I think Mao and, and, and the Politburo in China were ready, and they had the numbers to, to do Korea all over again if necessary, and Johnson didn't want that. Nobody wanted that. <laughs> the Soviets are an interesting uh, uh, breed uh, in that because after Stalin, with Khrushchev and into Brezhnev, you get into this search for detente. Hey, yeah, we're still top dog in the communist world, but eh, we'd like it better living together with the Americans and, and trying to you know, downplay all this is expensive stuff. But ironically, if you remember from last month with uh, Gates' discussion of the Cuban Missile Crisis, one of the immediate responses to the Soviet leadership is never again. Never again will the United States force us to back down in the international community. We're gonna build one of the world's biggest and baddest blue water navies. We're gonna beef up our Air Force, and they did. Now, it may have helped bankrupt them a little bit later on, uh, but that's, that gets into that emotional side of human nature. It's not all science. It's not all um, you know, uh, brain thinking as far as how we rationally look at warfare. Uh, and I think Vietnam is certainly part of that, and your question gets at the heart of the matter because the draft hit very large segments of American society that, why am I going? What am I doing? How am I contributing to anything by dying in Vietnam? And of course, the communists used that propaganda tremendously uh, against soldiers in Vietnam, and I don't need to bring up Hanoi Jane, I trust, for those who are, you know, okay, yeah, some of you remember uh, the beautiful, talented Jane Fonda, but once upon a time, uh, I'll leave it at that. Janet, one more question, please. Um, oh, you, you already identified one. So. And for those that raise your hand, I'll try to get with you after the Q&A uh, because we got to get ready for the, uh, the next group, right? Sir. Okay. So, so um, I want to end with, like, the last of your um, presentation was about Churchill and, like, oh, okay. the, the, the war is good, but it's not as bad as slavery. So, what do you, and, like, we hear, like, um, Rumor, there will always be wars or and rumors of war. <laughs> so what do you think about the overall war? Like, do you think war is attractive and horrifying at uh, the same time? And more of a, this is more of a philosophical question maybe instead of like specifically to Vietnam. I mean, why is, this, why, is it, why is war so attractive and horrifying at the same time? With your experience teaching at war colleges, do you come across this question? Oh yeah, we debate this all the time, and actually we've implemented an ethics course that gets into the morality issues of that. Um, most folks, most rational, reasonable folks, as we identify them, don't want to kill other people. It's not human nature necessarily to do that, yet war has been around for time immemorial. Whether you go back to Cain and Abel, uh, you may not call that war, but certainly the use of violence to compel your, your brother or adversary to do your will falls into that category. And you ask a very good and deep question, uh, and I don't have a very good answer for you other than, you know, we constantly prepare for war so that we don't have to go to war. Uh, it is a paradox. Uh, it doesn't make sense sometimes that why can't we just all go along, sing kumbaya, live happily ever after. Unfortunately, the human history is not, doesn't reflect that response. And if you buy it, and I thought I would get through one presentation without a Star Trek reference, but if you look to the future, uh, it doesn't look any better if you go into Star Trek or Star Wars or anything. We're, you know, we're, if we're not fighting other humans, we're fighting somebody out there, okay? And I think part of it's human nature, uh, that uh, given emotion, passion, that sometimes those emotions just can't be restrained, that we need to take out our anger or vengeance, that something, some things are simply worth dying for. But in the Churchill quote that you mentioned there, you know, slavery, and of course, well, poor Craig over here. Uh, Craig was at my, my presentation Tuesday night on Bleeding Kansas, uh, so he got a double whammy this week, so, and he's still awake, which is, is uh, somewhat of a compliment, I guess, uh, is um, was it worth the American Civil War to end the institution of slavery? I, I doubt anyone here would disagree with that statement, but in 1861, uh, uh, about half the country disagreed with that statement. Okay, that hey, you, you don't see it my way. This is not about slavery, it's about my way of life, it's about this, that, or the other. Okay, all associated in some way uh, with slavery. And the notion of, of honor, 
I mean, you look at the American political system. You remember uh, Hamilton and Burr uh, dueling each other. Uh, why do these bright, intelligent American politicians opt to shoot each other to resolve a dispute? Uh, so to, to kind of sum up here, because I'm over time as always, uh, great question. I think that's something all of us, and many of you probably have thought about this, why do we fight? Uh, is, are there things worse than war? Churchill says yes, I see his point, uh, but I think it's an individual decision, but even then, that makes it complicated because we're a society and we try to live with each other, and as a nation, we try to live with other nations, and you know, we've had the UN since 1946, and a great institution, but hasn't, doesn't have a great track record for preventing uh, conflict. And you can even look at Vietnam and ask the question, where is the UN? Why aren't they involved in this? Now they are, but not to the degree or to the effect that they might like. And on that happy note, again, thanks for all these great questions. I appreciate your uh, participation.